Well, good evening, everyone. We're glad you're back with us with a new study tonight. Hallelujah. Oh, this is going to be a great, great time together. Let's ask the Lord's blessing, shall we? Father, I thank you so much, in Jesus' name, for this wonderful opportunity to just delve into your word. Help us, Lord, to understand truly what you have for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before I talk about what we're going to study, um, I've expressed over the years my distaste and now coming around the other side for Hallmark movies. You know, if you've been with me for a number of years, you know I used to mock them and say, oh, you know, it's the same story. And then something happened to me. I think it's because I got old. And all of a sudden, I began to love them and watch, especially the Christmas ones. I really, really enjoyed that. But it was the same story, you know. Uh, boy meets girl. They come together. They have a fight. They break up. And magically, in the last two minutes of the movie, they fall back in love and everything's fine. Well, you know, it, it's not as simple as a Hallmark movie, but when you look at the book of Ruth, you see an idea of, of a story of a woman who loses her husband and sons and whose daughter-in-law comes with them, and everything seems to work out very well for the daughter-in-law, Ruth. But it's so much more deeper than that. You see, the story of Ruth is about redemption. It's about how God um, uses the story of Ruth as unexplained to us how Jesus um, comes and, and buys us back, if you will, into the love and the salvation of God. See, the story of Ruth is a beautiful story of love, and it is. And today we're going to begin to have conversation about how this story plays in. So we're going to divide up some of the chapters and the, paper, um, the verses over the next few weeks. So if you would, get to the book of Ruth, chapter number one. I want you to take a moment and find it, all right, because uh, it, it's, it's kind of like right in the middle there in the Old Testament towards the beginning, but, uh, you know, later on. And, you know, if somebody were to read the story of Ruth, it could just be something of, of just being in there, a nice story, but it means so much more. And in verse 1, I just want to look at the first sentence before we move on. And the first sentence says, In the days, now I use the NIV, okay, just so you know. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So, so let's stop there. Let's talk about what are judges. Now, we, we have an understanding of what judges are today in our American um, legal system. And we know they make decisions and we go before them and, and things of that nature. But, but the judges were, were much different in, in, in uh, their, their leadership capacity. In fact, before Israel had a king, it was a series of these tribal leaders that they called judges. And, and actually, if you were read, to read the book of Judges, and that's named after them, um, God used these men and women to save the Israelites from their enemies and lead them back to him. Um, but it, it's, very, it's a very sad book, even though there's some great stories through it, because it, it shows a, um, a cycle. And I had that cycle here somewhere, but that's okay. I don't really need to remember it. And that cycle shows where the judges would come, get the Israelites back with God, the judge would die, Israel would forget about God, and would rise up to another judge who would take their place and go on. And, and it was a constant cycle of sin and deliverance. Israel rebels, God disciplines, Israel repents, and God delivers them. It, it, it's very interesting that way. And in fact, <clears throat> the book of Judges lists, lists 12 judges. We're not going to go through all of them. But... Um, you know, names that you may from, be familiar with, um, Gideon or, or Deborah or Samson. Remember Samson? All of them were, were judges. In fact, um, the book of 1 Samuel lists Eli the priest, Samuel the prophet, and, and his sons in, in that role, but, but not necessarily um, in that. So that's where this is in play, if you will. Okay, 
during the time when the judges ruled. And it says when, when this judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Now, now understand, you've you got to remember the time. <clears throat> you know, the, the storehouses, you know, were, were bare sometimes. Um, you know, we, we go through some things when there's a stop in the markets or things of that nature. So we have a little bit of that, but nowhere near this understanding. So we have to really think <clears throat> how that works. So it says, so a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live in the city, or the country, I should say, of Moab. Now, we're going to get to that in just a moment. The man's name was Elimelech. <clears throat> his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his sons were Malon and Kilion. And they were Epaphrodites, Epaphrodites, I'm sorry, from Bethlehem, Judah, and went on to Moab, and they lived there. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting about Moab? Well, <clears throat> what's interesting about Moab is that the people that lived there were descendants of, of Lot. And the Israelites <clears throat> did not think very highly of the Moabites because they believed they were conceived in sin. <clears throat> in fact, Numbers chapter 21 through 25 tells us that the interactions um, with Israel were not good at all. They were really, really bad. And um, the Israelites married Moabite women, and then they went to go serve the Moabite god, Baal. So, so there, <clears throat> it was not a good place to be. So it's very interesting to even note that this man from Bethlehem <clears throat> would, would go and move to Moab. Now, you know, the question comes in, why? In fact, it's interesting, because of the title that we read in um, verse number two, it, it, it lends itself to say that Elimelech and his, his family came from money. Okay, they had a title. So this was not a, a poor man by any stretch of the imagination. And... You know, one of the main thoughts of, of this is he moved to Moab so his family had food. That was pretty much the, because there's no clear understanding. You look at verse 1 and 2, it just says he moved. And he moved to a, a land that was not full of godly people. They worshipped um, idols. So why he went, whether it was just to get away from the um, a famine or whether, again, it's speculation at best. Um, but the truth is, when he went there, it could have been for the wrong reasons. Now, I, I ask you this. How many times have we made decisions and mainly thought it was the best thing to do? And then we find out, oh, it really wasn't. See, there's times that we will ask, you know, of God, God, maybe I should do this. And we really believe with all our heart, everything's right. There's also times that every single, every single thing we do means something and something and something and something. And it's like you put it all together. It's like, how can I not? This makes so much sense. You ever hear that term? I'd be, I'd be silly not to do it. <clears throat> Yet in the economy of God, there's sometimes that he lines everything up and he's not tricking us, okay? He's not tricking us. But in our natural sense, it makes sense, okay? It's like, yeah, this seems to work. But then when we look back and say, oh, why did I do that? It's because God goes to teach us. See, don't ever forget that God is always in the teaching business, okay? He will never stop teaching us. And the more the dependence on him, the more we'll hear from him. So as far as Elimelech was concerned, if we go on the idea that, you know, he was getting away from the uh, famine, <laughs> that made sense. But now we get to verse 3. It says, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. Now, again, we don't know if that was early into the journey. Um, I'm not sure if there's extra historical facts that would say it, <clears throat> but we don't know exactly when this occurred. Um, but we know that, that he died and was left with her two sons. And now we start getting into an interesting thing because remember we mentioned about 
um, the Israelites marrying into uh, the Moabite family. And it says they married Moabite women. Now, of course, because that's where they were born. That's where they were from. You know, it's interesting. I've talked to many missionary friends who, um, who would go on a mission field with their wife or husband, you know, um, their spouse, and their children when they're young. And, you know, whether they were in a country where it was a different color or a different ethnic, whatever it was, um, as they grew up in that, it was interesting how they took on some of the culture <clears throat> of where they were growing up, and it would make sense that they would. That's what they've known. You know, it's interesting because growing up, I was always convinced that on Thanksgiving, you had turkey, stuffing, and lasagna. Always convinced. Everybody in the world has turkey and stuffing and lasagna on Thanksgiving. Do you know how surprised I was when I found out there was actually some people that did not have lasagna on Thanksgiving? My heart was broken. I said, what are you people missing? <clears throat> then, of course, I, I use that comically, but to make the point of saying, I, I can't blame these boys because that's where they were. They grew up in the culture, and they grew up, and they married Moabite women. One was named Orpah, and the other was Ruth. Now, I'm sure Naomi was happy that her sons were taken care of, as any parent would be. But let's get to the point of, of where we're at. All right, Naomi leaves her, her land, okay? She married, leaves her land with her family, and now she doesn't have her husband. She has her two sons, and they're married with Moabite women, and that's fine and, and well, and that's what it is. But then something happens. After they live there about 10 years, both Manlin and Killian also died. Once again, we don't know, um, at least through biblical accounts, you know, if it was from a sickness or did they have an accident? Were they in um, military? We don't know anything. We just know that both of them died. And here's a very, very sad line. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. You know, when you begin to read this, the beginning of this story, you come to a very, very sad conclusion. And that's that this world does not offer all the beauty that it professes. There is tragedy. The, 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 the reason I'm coming to you from here and presenting in this way, instead of being together in our church, it's because of this tragedy that's called the pandemic that has disrupted everything we're doing, okay? And, and for many people, they, they've had loved ones passed. Um, many have lost jobs. Finances are in ruins. I mean, I'm giving you a sad story because the reality we all have to come to grips with is in our life, there are going to be sad stories. There are going to be moments when we just are, are lost. You know, I think about Naomi. And in, in our next study, we're going to explore her story a little bit more and what she came with. But when we look at all that was lost and all that was apart and all that was gone, you know, there's just a couple questions that, that come to my mind. And, and that's this, relationships. You know, relationships with people are so important because James calls life a vapor. He said it's here and it's gone. I think many, many, sadly, many people have seen the truth of that. And my question to you today in reading this story is do you know people that have a similar scenario? Do you know people that have lost someone, maybe over the course of the last eight, nine weeks, especially? 
And I ask you, what have you done to encourage them? Honestly, I mean, let, let's go to self-examination for a moment. We have email, texting, telephone, internet, mail. We have so many ways to reach out to somebody. We can send flowers. We can send a, a card. We can send a gift. What have you done to reach out to those people? See, the story of Ruth is, is about redemption. And there are people today who are hurt. There are people in our church you haven't seen in eight weeks. I mean, I'm thankful for our Zoom. Um, I'm thankful for those platforms that allows me to talk and see people. Just a few weeks ago, Mary and I saw the children. Oh, it was so great just to see them and to hear from them. But I ask you, who have you reached out to? And it's not too late. It's not too late to reach out to someone and to say, how are you? I heard about what happened. I'm very sad about it. See, see understand, God is going to help us through these scenarios. He's going to help us through these situations. But you've got to remember that we have to move forward. So here we are. Elimelech is gone. The boys, they're gone. And Naomi and two daughter-in-laws are all that's left of this family. How is God going to help them? What is God going to do? Well, we're going to take a moment to just give a little preview. Okay, we're going to talk about this next week. But I want to just look at verse 6 and then move on from there. And when Naomi heard that in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughter-in-laws, daughters-in-law, prepared to return home from there. In the midst of struggles, my friend, remember we talked about the, the one Sunday sermon just a few weeks ago, remember? Where we said, God has not forgotten. We gotta wait on the Lord. Well, it took a while it took at least over 10 years. But word finally got back to Naomi that there was food back. And Naomi said, I'm going to go home. What happened after that? Well, you're just going to have to come back next week and find out. Can you do that? I hope so. Because I want you to be a part of this study. But in the meantime, reach out. Get to some people. See how they're doing. Maybe it's in about two or three weeks since you talk to them. Talk with them and ask God, God, give me the words. Give me the right moment, the divine appointment to reach out to them. Okay, next week, come back, 715, but let's pray. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, that you helped us and that you continue to help us. And Father, as we study now this, this book of Ruth, may you help us in all that we do, Lord, to reach out and to encourage people. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, we got to find out what happened, all right? Come back. God bless.